Grumpy Old Geeks, a weekly talk show hosted by Brian Schulmeister and Jason DeFilippo discussing the finer points of what went wrong on the internet and who's to blame. Welcome to Grumpy Old Geeks for January 1st, 2016. My God, it's 2016. My God, it is 2016. We are actually recording this on New Year's Eve day yes. on uh, December 31st because, Brian, you are up in the land of uh, Torontonians, aren't you? Yes, yes, I'm actually recording live from my in-law's basement in <laughs> some suburb of Toronto. Yeah, and I'm going downtown to spend New Year's Eve with some friends, and it's entirely unsure as to what time I will be getting back up here tomorrow, so figured it's better to record today. Excellent, yeah. I, you go out on New Year's Eve. I stay home. I'm usually in bed by 9 o'clock. <laughs> I, well, I don't really go out anymore. That's It's always kind of a conundrum what I'm going to do if I'm stuck in L.A. for New Year's. Uh, we just uh, we go over to a friend's house. We do, a, you know, we have a, like about 10, 15 people show up, a big potluck, lots of booze, hang out at the house. That's it. Take it <laughs> easy. <laughs> All right. Sounds, uh, yeah. sounds decent. Yeah, no, just stay home because uh, it is, it, you know, this is kind of a, an interesting episode because we did an episode with Sean Bonner or I did, uh, yeah. I did an episode with Sean. Yeah, Bonner. I, I heard you did. Where, where is that? The interesting thing about that is in between recording that episode and having time to edit it and publish it last week. That's why we were kind of dark last week. We planned to be dark, but we thought, Oh, Hey, let's try and do a grump on grump. Well, in between recording and editing, I got a puppy. I saw uh, you have done the most updates you have ever done ever on social media, or at least Facebook. I, I think it w in the last few days since you got the puppy, you have done more updates on Facebook than the entire time that Facebook has existed. I think so, too. Yes, I am. I'm a very proud dad. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> but maybe yes. with all those updates, you, you might win that Zuckerberg million dollar award that uh, apparently that uh, they even said it's true on Good Morning America. You fucking retards. <laughs> Uh, bring me up to speed on this. Cause I, I, I've been posting, but I haven't been reading because like I said, I got a puppy. Oh, there was some sort of thing where if you copy another one of those copy and paste bullshit messages that show up on Facebook. So everybody was copying and pasting because due to the windfall and, and Zuckerberg's generosity with his new child, uh, if you post this status message at midnight tonight, he will award uh, 10 people with a million dollars or something like that. And this is coming in a couple waves. And at the very end of it, it adds, we know, I know this is true because I saw it on good morning America. People are actually buying into this stuff still. Oh, it's a good way to figure out who you should defriend and or block. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, with this puppy thing, it's been, uh, it's been interesting to say the least. <laughs> she was, uh, I've had a pet before I've had probably 10 dogs and eight cats. Okay. All right. Just checking. Yeah, no, but I've never had a Rottweiler puppy. She's a full bred Rottweiler and she was seven weeks old when I got her, which is a little young, unfortunately, but yep. the, the people that were, that got her, were letting they couldn't have her because of their kids. Their kids were having nightmares about it because the idiots were stupid enough to show show them a picture of what she was going to look like when she was all grown up. <laughs> uh, which yeah yeah cue nightmares and and she's teething so she's very bitey. Yeah. So they were they needed to get rid of her quick and I'm like oh I don't want her to go to a bad home just because they're trying to get rid of her. So it's it has been a trial. Very, <laughs> very optimistic of you, Jason. And I would, uh, I would have to say that uh, I have two thoughts regarding your puppy that have come to me over the last week. Uh, first off, you've definitely never had a pet in the social media age before, because, like I said, uh, wow, that's a lot of puppy photos. Uh, actually, if you go back to kind of pre-social media, I had, I had pictures of my cats up all the damn time back in the early days, all the time. Cat blog. Uh, it was Flickr. All my, all my cat pictures were on Flickr. <laughs> yeah. And then my second thought was, uh, make sure, uh, puppy never hears, uh, you should never go back and listen to some of our older episodes where you talk about shooting dogs or wanting to. <laughs> I've actually got a book that, uh, uh, so the first thing I did was I, I started texting Tim Ferriss. I'm like, dude, I know you, I, you've been doing this dog thing for six months. Send me everything you've got. <laughs> so, uh, he sent me a book and the, the book has the worst title in the world. It's called don't shoot the dog. <laughs> well, I know. I think that's a good one for you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to shoot the dog. I love my dog. She's okay, she's good. adorable. Okay. Somebody actually said I should name should have named her Adorbs, but now have you studied up on on what's been going everywhere on social media today, which is how to keep your pet uh, in not going crazy for fireworks for New Year's Eve? I have not because I've been actually out playing with the puppy to you know okay. <laughs> try and socialize her and have a nice time. 
Oh, you might want to study up a little bit before uh, before this evening. Okay, I will. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I have to say, whoever invented crate training, I, I they're my hero. They are my hero. If I'd have known about this long ago when I had uh, my other puppies, life would have been a lot easier. <laughs> well, it's not become a pet podcast. No, it will not become a pet podcast. I will have another podcast for that probably. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, here's the deal. If you get it, it's us. You know, you get That's, into a hobby. You have to You have to make a blog. You have to make a podcast. You have to have social media accounts for everybody. That's yeah. just how we do it. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to one more uh, like on, on Grumpy Old Geeks from your from your dog's uh, Facebook account. Exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. yes. Bam Bam will will be very, very active on social media. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Block. Oh, you, you dick. Um, anyway, so yeah, we've got I've got it in the can with the episode with Sean. We're going to get it out um, probably sometime next week. We'll, we'll throw it out there. I was going to put it at the end of this, but I realized I went and looked at the episode. Sean and I talked for over an hour, so huh? it's well, a very long episode, so I want to cut it down a bit. All right, you do that. I was about to say you could tack it onto this because uh, we don't really have that much. We've, we've both taken a little bit of a vacation. There is a very good chance if you get to the end of this podcast and realize that it's going really long, stay, oh, to, stay, stay tuned for uh, Sean Bonner and I doing a Grump on Grump. Excellent. So uh, we've talked about drones and all this stuff in the past. Mm -hmm. And I found a, a link on Facebook. Uh, it, it's basically a drone bird. These guys have, have <laughs> made a remote controlled bird that looks extraordinarily lifelike. It's a pretty cool video. It's a very cool video. It will be in the show notes at grumpy slash 141. Uh, and I, I speculated that the NSA has probably already bought like 10,000 of these just to have, have them up there. It's like, Oh, that's not a, that's not a drone. That's a bird. It's a bird. It's a plane. That it's never a lands. Drone. It's, yeah, it's a, a drone. bird that never lands. <laughs> it's drone man. Yeah. Uh, and I was just going to say, since this is the New Year's Eve episode and, and what we end up doing every New Year's all across all magazines everywhere is talk about New Year's resolutions. And uh, one that always seems to come up, especially in this day and age, is leave it at the office, a New Year's resolution you'll actually keep. This is an article in Slate. Uh, apparently it's a new one, though it might as well be recycled from the past 10 years. Uh, although... Actually, it is new because I see that they're kind of giving up. It used to be like, just work from 9 to 6 and then go home. Uh, this one goes, here's a New Year's resolution. Try to stop working from home at 9 p.m. So we're just giving up. I That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God. The, thing, the thing about it is, you know, you just it's never going to change. It's, it's never going to end. No, once you've opened that Pandora's box of, uh, I mean, this is what we're doing to ourselves with all this technology. It's supposed to make life easier and whatever. All it does is mean we're we're reachable and available twenty four seven, and everything takes advantage of that. So, yay! Yeah, I just think if you know, a judicious use of do not disturb. Yes, is I, is really good because that way you can you can you know actually look somebody in the eye and say I did not get your message because it was <laughs> ten o'clock at night. And your phone wasn't actually talking to you. Yeah, and, I mean, the key is really not to look at your phone. It, you can have the phone on you all you want, but they will see that you read the message if you keep checking it. Right. Oh, that's another thing that you should turn off is send read receipts. In your, <laughs> if you use an <laughs> iPhone, sending read receipts is what lets people know that you have actually seen the message. So yes. if you turn that off, you still have plausible deniability <laughs> that you haven't actually seen the message, even if you had and you just would rather watch some TV. So I say just make your New Year's uh, resolution plausible deniability. In the news. So we talked a bit about David Lowry and uh, his, his anger and frustration with uh, Spotify and basically streaming services in general. More than a few times, uh, he is the front man from Camper Van De Beethoven and Cracker. Um, he has filed a $150 million class action lawsuit against Spotify. Well, that's saying something. I think so. I, 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 I read through this a little bit, and we have the, the link in the show notes that kind of discusses the specifics of what he is actually suing on, which is things along the lines of the Spotify did not actually get uh, correct mechanical licensing for music, which is probably going over a lot of people's heads that aren't in the industry. Um, it's an interesting case. I'm not entirely sure, having seen some of these contracts, that he's correct, but there is what we call wiggle room there. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I'm glad he did this. I, because I think, you know, again, sunshine, uh, and transparency is the only way that the music industry is actually going to be able to move forward. And this might push things that direction. 
So why is he just going against Spotify instead of all of the streaming services? Uh, because of the basically the way that you have to do class action lawsuits. You just can't sue them all, so you sue the big boy. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the way that works. That'll be interesting to see how that one shakes out for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be really, really interested in it. And I'm, it's, it, it's cool that it's a class action lawsuit as opposed to him just doing it specifically because that means, uh, you know, all the other artists can kind of glom on board with this one. Um, yeah, we'll see. I'm definitely interested to see what happens with this. It's going to be a pretty slow process, I believe. Um, so we'll see. All right. Yeah. So there's that. Um, <laughs> I also, uh, we've talked a lot about, uh, especially you, because you've had your, your, you know, about online rights and things just basically being stolen, reappropriated. We talked about Taylor Swift a bit two weeks ago. Uh, you've talked about personally your photos being kind of taken and used by people. Yeah, flat uh, out um, stolen and used as album art. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I guess Madonna's in a bit of trouble. And of course, it's not Madonna. This is Madonna's team. Um, basically took in image done by artist uh, Danny Cork of Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, and Reddit uh, has gotten involved in this, and they're quite pissed off. Uh, took one of his images, basically kind of uh, cut and pasted Madonna's face over it and used it all across social media, very similar to Taylor Swifty kind of thing. Okay. And um, well, so this, this, it, they, they modified it. They at least modified the original piece and put yeah, Madonna's which, face on it. I believe, well, yeah, but is that enough? I mean, we used to have these arguments all the time back in the burgeoning days of the internet. How many changes do you have to make to something that is officially reappropriated enough to be legal? There was uh, actually, yeah, there was actually a percentage of the yes. piece that had to be had to be remastered to make it your own. Yeah. And I don't know if just looking no. at, looking at this image, it's a very small piece and it's not really substantially changing the focus of the artwork itself. It's just changing a small piece of it because no. usually it has to be a transformative action that really gets you out of hot water. And this is not a, not a very transformative action at all. No, not at all. I mean, I seem to remember it was something along the lines of five significant changes like color scale, blah, 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 blah. That, and this is just basically, this is a cut and paste of Madonna's face over the art uh, that was posted out there. And obviously she's just using this on social media. This isn't album artwork. This isn't uh, anything that's actually technically making her money at this point. Uh, much like Taylor Swift two weeks ago, but it's still kind of messed up. <laughs> yeah, it is. You could also say it's, I mean, he's got a case to say it's devaluing the, you know, the value of his original artwork. Yeah. So, and again, I, I feel like we're just kind of much, we're kind of giving up to a certain extent because uh, what she should actually be doing is paying him for the art. Uh, but much like we said with Taylor Swift two weeks ago, uh, at least give him credit. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> you know, that's really what it, and, and it's kind of pathetic that we've come to that point where that's, that's, we're kind of going to go, okay, well, if you're going to use it on social media, at least give a credit and link and shout out to the original artist when, you know, really it should be paying up. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of paying <laughs> hey, <well>. up, <laughs> um, remember we talked about that, that uh, Star Trek fan film Axanar a while ago? Yeah, yeah, I, I think I, is that the one I watched? And I know there's another one that has the dude from Mythbusters. I can't, I, I can't, I can't keep all the fan stuff apart anymore. Okay, well, this one has, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm looking at the Indiegogo campaign, $568,679 was raised mm -hmm. uh, back in August. That's, I think that's when we talked about it. And I think over the course of it, because they've done Kickstarter goals as well, oh, they've, they've raised over a million dollars to create this quote unquote fan Film. Wait, hold on one second. You mean that they went to one crowdfunding source and got money, and then they went on to another crowdfunding source and got more money, and they still haven't delivered anything yet? Oh, well, here, here's the rub. <laughs> 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 okay, so this one also, uh, here's, here's the deal with this one. It has Richard Hatch, Tony Todd. Oh, okay, right. This is the, that one, Gary Graham. Okay. Um, so it's got, it's got professional actors, professional set, professional you know, studio so it's people. A, it's a real effing movie. It is. Okay. And, and so Paramount and CBS are like, um, excuse me. <laughs> are no. we own the rights, the intellectual rights to all these things? <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah. It's, this is not a fan movie anymore, right? I mean, even that is kind of skating on thin ice. And, you know, there's an argument to let it go because it's increasing the brand and let the have fans have fun. You don't want to piss them off. Uh, but when budgets are getting up to a million dollars and you have real actors and it's a professional quality prequel, you got to pay for the rights to that. Yes, you do. Oh boy, <laughs> uh, they're suing for a hundred and fifty thousand dollars for every uh, infringement. Of, wow! Of, of, so it's like they're basically saying we will crush you now. Yeah, we will crush you. We will. Uh, we will cling on your ass around Uranus. 
<laughs> yeah, and the the filmmaker, <sighs> the filmmaker is like, oh, we've been waiting for this lawsuit. I'm like, well, why didn't you just get the rights? You know, why didn't yeah. you pay for the rights or work with them to kind of build it? And I'm sure that they would start like, you know, it's CBS and Paramount. That that process would take years to do yeah. anything. But this guy is also he he has licensed stuff from CBS before. He's a professional filmmaker. So you know, he knows, he knows what he's, what he's doing. doing. So yeah. do you think this is just a promo play to get attention in Hollywood? You know, it's it's kind of unknown. It's to get here. a studio to hire him to make some sort of other sci-fi thing. Well, the funny thing is, there's there's new Star Trek. There's a new Star Trek show in the works. So yeah, this could exactly. just be you know a very very silly play for for publicity. Get, yeah, get me on to direct some of those. Well, I mean, I mean, it could be from CBS and Paramount's point of view. Well, to I get know. to get some press for their new show, but their new show isn't this even has been ready going yet. On. This has been going on for way longer before they even announced that, though. Yeah, no, this whole thing is silly. But I, you'd think that with a million bucks, they could at least like say, "Hey, guys, can we can we get permission to do this?" Because it's like I can't go out and make you know. Uh, let's go make a new Star Wars. Yeah, let's go make a new Star Wars. I, I, you know what I feel like today? I feel like making a new Mission Impossible movie. Brian, why don't you and I go fund that and make a new Mission Impossible movie? I mean, it's it's so sure, I can, silly. I can, get, I can get the music off the internet for free. Exactly. Yeah, we you can re- get the theme song. No problem. You remember what happened with that theme song, right? In Mission Impossible One. No, what happened? Oh, here's a great here's a great copyright story. So the guy who you know composed the original Mission Impossible theme. Mm-hmm. They they never contacted him when they did Mission Impossible One. Oh, and they did a remake of it, right? Like yeah, the, the first one yeah. with Tom Cruise. You know the whole Tom, the whole Tom Cruise reboot with Mission Impossible. They never contacted him about the rights, and he never did anything about it. He's just like he sat back and waited, and is just like, "Hey, let's see what happens." Sure <sighs> enough, boom! Theme song in the movie. <laughs> Unbelievable. He got such a massive check and a big old smile on his face because they never they never contacted him and he was well within his rights to do exactly what he did. He waited, yeah, because he didn't know if it was going to be in there. And he went to the movie theater and he's like, "That's my song." And, and he went, "Ching!" Yep, pretty much. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'm, I'm moving to Maui again. I mean, this is the whole this is the prevalent economy 2.0 theory, which is just go f and do it and to hell with anyone else and hope you don't get caught. Yeah, and that whole you know. We we were taught in art school. It's better to you know ask for forgiveness than permission. Well, not always. Not always. It'll end up costing you quite a lot. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's get into uh, into uh, you know my my pet topic for all of 2015. Let's talk Uber. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so California has approved an app called Flywheel. Uh, this is a basically developed. A, Smartly so by by uh, I think a third party thing, and they went to basically all the regular taxi companies and said, "Here, since you were so stupid that you couldn't figure out that uh, the main reason that people love Uber is the uh, convenience of the app, here's a version that'll work. Okay. It's just like Uber, except it's for regu- regular taxis. You can do everything that Uber does. In fact, you can even do more because you can book rides ahead of time, which is nice. Which I you know I miss about." Which I can't. I, I I wish Uber had because things like okay, I have to be. I have to get picked up at four a.m. to go to LAX. How am I going to be sure that there's somebody out there with their damn Uber? But you can uh, with Flywheel in theory, you can you can do that. Uh, so I giddy and happy as I was as I went and downloaded the app and set myself up on it and put in my credit card and all the other things just like you do for Uber. And then the app didn't work and it kept saying it couldn't find a car anywhere and I gave up. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, it is brand new. I'll give it that. Uh, so we'll see what it's like when I get back to L.A. when I never use cabs anyways. Okay. Yeah, that was the quickest shark fin in, in Grumpy Old Geeks history. <laughs> uh, you know, it's new. We'll see what happens. But, uh, yeah, I was I was very happy, and I think that they, you know, kind of did their promotions and publicity a little bit soon. Have it working first. Oh, wait. We don't do that. No, we don't do that anymore. This is Economy 2.0. Put it out there, and who cares if it works or not? Yes, we've moved from the alpha, I mean, the beta to the alpha stage. It's just like, oh, hey, it kind of, it boots. Let's let's put it out. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. So uh, I'm here in Toronto right now where there is a bit of an Uber uh, Uber fight and battle going on. Um, Again, I I don't hate Uber. I don't hate Airbnb. I don't hate any of these Economy 2.0 apps. Um, I just ask that they play by the same rules that everybody else does, and it's a level playing field, and they've been getting away with not doing that, and they get all butthurt about it. Um, 
so we're here in, in Toronto, and uh, there's a lot of protests going along because uh, basically every year on the 1st, uh, uh, taxi companies have to pay their license fees, and there's always a percentage hike. Uh, this year, I think it's on January 1st, taxi drivers who want to renew their licenses here in Toronto face a 2.5% fee hike, uh, which is uh, substantial, and you got to pay that out if you want to be a taxi driver. Guess who doesn't have to pay shit? Ubers and Lyfts exactly. and anybody else who's skirting the, skirting the rules. Exactly. So is that fair? No. No, it's not. So What you going to do about it? Are you going to get out there with your sign? Are you going to pick it with them? Say equal equality for everybody? You know, put your, put your two cents in? Dude, it's cold out there. You big pussy. I'm, I'm not going out there. No, it's not my battle to fight. What I do is I don't use Uber. That's that's my battle. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I've been in the city, um, and I've taken a cab twice, and I have not taken Uber yet. So. Well, Toronto's that, a great walking town. It's a great walking town. That's true. But uh, when you have a, a meeting across town in 15 minutes, you're not going to make it. Okay. And you have to do something. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, basically in response to that, uh, there's a couple of weird things going on here in Toronto, which I like. Uh, insurance agencies, just your regular car insurance agencies, are starting to ask people, um, are you driving for Uber or is this just your personal car? Because if you are driving for Uber, we're going to charge you a lot more for insurance. Yeah, well, they should. You're on the road more. As they should. So that's another way that Uber winners have been, or Uber drivers have been skirting basically regulations and costs and fees that uh, more established agencies have to pay. So that'll be changing here, at least a little bit. And there's a definitely some move forward that uh, the, uh, the city government here is going to be really looking into Uber and trying to figure out a way to make this a basically uh, level playing field, as they should be. So Uber will not be getting the free ride in Toronto that they have been getting for quite a long time. All right. I found, yes. yes, I found an article that was right up your alley because you were putting all these Uber things in. I'm like, okay, it's the last, last show of the year. I'll, I'll humor Brian and put in my Let's own Uber. There. It's only because I am in Toronto and it's a big deal here right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because nobody here gives a shit. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, Shannon Liss Riordan. Have you mm-hmm. heard of her before? I have not. She's the woman leading. Uh, she's, she's basically a, uh, the woman that's like leading the class action lawsuit against Uber, Lyft, and nine other apps that provide oh, like on-demand it. services. I'm a fan of Shannon. Yeah, she is, a, she is basically a lawyer for the peoples. Good. You know, she, she is a labor law lawyer. And Excellent. Oh, the labor laws. Remember those guys? Hey, Silicon Valley, labor laws. Yeah, and in 2012, she won a 14.1 million judgment for Starbucks baristas in Massachusetts, uh, $325,000 to American Airlines. There's all sorts of stuff that she's been out there doing. You should look this woman up because I, I think you, you and her should go have a drink. I'm going to go send her a friend request. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> so this is, this is they call her, uh, well, what was it, uh, Sledgehammer Shannon. So. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. I love that. So the other big news story right about now is is these so-called hoverboards, which, by the way, people... They they're not hoverboards. Hover. They are not hoverboards. They are basically mini... What are, that, what are those things called? Mini segways. They're segways without any big tilt. That's all they are. Yeah, and the funny thing not is, hoverboards. Segway was sold to one of these companies. Oh, of course it was. That yeah, segway, Segway's gone. Dean Kamen is no longer involved, and now it's turned <laughs> into annoying things you see at the mall. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, These things are everywhere and they're not electric skateboards either because skateboards go the other way, not forward. Exactly. Yes. They are not any of those things, but they are definitely not hoverboards. Now I'm a little torn on this. Um, I, obviously there are some issues. Uh, apparently the batteries can tend to explode sometimes. So we, <laughs> that, that's to... funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not good. Um, it is a weird story too, about how they kind of came to be. Nobody really sort of knows. And the, this was explored on one or two podcasts. I can't remember the name right now, but if you're, it, it's interesting if you want to look into it and kind of go down the rabbit hole on these hoverboards. Um, but, uh, so airlines have basically said, uh, uh-uh, uh, you're going to have to ship these freight. We're not putting these on planes, which is great. Uh, I agree with that because if you know, something has a tendency to explode, how about let's not put it on a plane. Yeah, definitely. Um, the problem with that being, of course, that this was the big gift for a lot of people for the holidays. So there are a lot of people that need to get these things home now. It's called UPS, people. <laughs> yes, it's called UPS, including uh, who's that uh, crazy actor from Australia that gets in fights all the time? Has a band. Russell Crowe? Russell Crowe apparently this morning tweeted that it was very upset because he could not take his hoverboards on the plane. Oh, <laughs> poor want, baby. We've got to get these goddamn hoverboards off our plane. 
Get these motherfucking hoverboards off my motherfucking plane. Exactly. And the other big issue, at least in L.A., is there have been a number of laws that are going into play and have been enacted about these hoverboards, including, but not limited to, that riders must be at least 16 years old to ride them. And unfortunately, this uh, will go into effect January 1st. And uh, basically, everybody known to man bought this for their under 16-year-old kids. Yeah, I've actually, a friend of mine brought her daughter over to the house. She's 12. Yeah, 11 or 12 and she's got one and they were riding it around and but it, you know she's that's the demo that's the main demo except when we were in uh oh uh, when i went to defcon or not defcon the DerbyCon, the hacker convention in louisville i saw a ton of people in business suits riding those things to work <laughs> of course a ton of them like <laughs> full-on business suits like men and women it was like a 50 50 split they were just cooking down the street it's like oh yeah but yeah, yeah, it's mostly kids. So yeah, this yeah, is not so going to work. It's this is a stupid it, law. It, well, the law, the timing is just horrible, and people are of course kind of outraged about this because it's like you could have mentioned this like uh, two months ago when we were all purchasing them for our children because they're not cheap. No, they're not cheap at all. Um, and then I also, of course, have the other issue with it, which is the same issue I have with electric bikes. Uh, are are we fat or not? Yes, yeah, seriously. As a society, are we fat or not? Because how about just uh, no electric power for these things to get around? How about you just get your fucking fat ass on the fucking bike or a fucking skateboard? The funny thing is, though, I've never seen a fat person on one of these. They can't balance on them. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm not not getting one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But now, you know what? You can buy a real hoverboard. It'll cost you almost 20 grand. But really? there is a... It has to be over a very specific surface, though, too, right? No, it doesn't. Oh, really? This one does Because I remember reading that there was one that worked, but it had to be over, like, an electrically charged metal surface. It, it wasn't electrically charged. It just had to be over metal. That's the one okay. that they showed Tony Hawk riding. Okay. Yeah, that's that That will float. It just uses, you know, electromagnetic medita- uh, levitation to keep the board <laughs> above it. This is a big box of fans. <laughs> it's all it is. <laughs> it looks like a, a mattress. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's great i want one it's fans and batteries that's all that's in this thing and you can control it with your smartphone but it's going to cost you almost 20 grand okay well i don't want one that bad no i don't either I'd, i would much rather walk <laughs> can you imagine you spent the 20 grand on this and then the next day there was legislation saying that you couldn't ride it <laughs> exactly that would suck <laughs> and it'll only go for three to six minutes oh jesus so yeah it's like okay yeah. well it's it's cute so call yeah. call us when it's 500 bucks exactly oh but in other news, uh, we've always bitched about uh, AT&T and cell phones and Verizon and all those people. Well, AT&T is finally getting a little bit more savvy. They're killing all of their two-year contracts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the that's good. The bad part about it is you're not going to be getting subsidized phones anymore either. True. Uh, true. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> They're basically doing it because they realize they could make more money selling you the damn phones. Yeah, yeah, and their AT and T next plan and all that crap. It's still, I, I did the math on it, and it just doesn't work out. So I think from now on, I'm going to just go to Apple and buy the phone outright and just own it. And yeah. now, and now Apple's got their trade in program where you can get money back on the phone that you've already got. So I'm yeah. going to go. I'm going to go in. With, I've got like seven iPhones. <laughs> I'm going to take them all in and say, how much can I get for all of these? Yeah, I, I mean that's a, that's where I've already gone. When I got the uh, six six uh, S, I basically just bought it outright, and that's that. So uh, on the plus side, it gives me the ability to switch carriers easily if I'd want to. But you know, I, where I live, it's Verizon or nothing. So I'm yeah, stuck for me, it's AT and T or nothing. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, yeah. So they, I, I like how it's an. It's a good study for me in how AT&T tries to present this as, yay, this is good for you, when really not so much. <laughs> yeah, no, this is them just trying. It, it, what they figured out is, oh, people are finally getting savvy to us taking all their money and, mm-hmm. and changing or going to somewhere else or figuring something else out. So yeah. this is just a, yeah. We figured out a different way to take your money. Exactly. We're just going to charge you more over a shorter term than less for a longer <laughs> term. That's exactly all it is. Exactly. Awesome. Security? Ha! Are you registered to vote, Brian? Uh, yes. Well, then your data may have been leaked last week. Yay! <laughs> yeah, there's there's a database running around of 191 million voter uh, records. And the, this is an interesting story because it's kind of hard to nail down because the database is gone. Nobody can seem to find it anymore. It was posted for a while, then removed. Yeah. And... 
it consisted mainly of public information that was already available in different different places, but kind of compiled into kind one of, yeah. database. Compiled, um, correlated, uh, once it's got first name, middle name, last name, home address, mailing address, phone number, date of birth, party affiliation, and logs of whether or not you voted, which is interesting. Going back to 2000, that is quite interesting. It's a very interesting database. but That's, a, that's can, a lot of data to have about someone. And nobody can figure out where it came from. Exactly. That is the most interesting thing. And it's really the only new news I've seen in the last couple of days, which is people going, where did this come from? Who owns it? Who put this together and why? Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> I mean, I understand why, because, you know, people who are oh, this is running incredibly valuable if you're running for office. Exactly. Yeah. You, yeah. you got to know who to call. Who are you going to call? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's it's a weird one. And that's that's pretty much all I got for the main <laughs> the main information this week on security, because that really piqued my interest. The fact that this is kind of, it's a mystery. Yeah. It's a very mysterious database to begin with. And uh, they're saying it's not a hack, just somebody found it somewhere and now it can't be found anymore because it's gone to the dark web. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And this is a big deal. This is a big one. So we're going to keep an eye on this one for sure. I just wanted to, I just wanted to mention it because you know, there's like 350 odd million people in the U S and 191 you know, registered voters. Hmm. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't sound right to me. That sounds, that number sounds high. Well, no, considering like 20% of the population turns out to actually vote. Well, there's a big difference between being registered to vote and actually voting. Um, I think that sounds fairly accurate to me, but who knows? I mean, there's a lot you can, this is pretty serious demographic information that a lot of, um, you can make a lot of inferences about people from, um, especially when you're talking party affiliation and whether they actually did vote or not and with what frequency. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. No, it's definitely an interesting data point. What's Mm -hmm. not very interesting is uh, John McAfee's new security product. He says it's an effing game changer. Fugitive presidential candidate. (laughs) Jesus Christ, this guy's a nutbag. I love him, though. I love him to death. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, The thing about this is what it looks like is he just recreated one password. I need need to dig into it a little more, but it's called Every Key. And uh, next time we're going to have a little bit more, but it's going around now because I can't believe he's still calling himself a presidential candidate because nobody has heard from him in like weeks. Yeah, because he's uh, in Belize or something like that. No, no, no. He's uh, he's, he lives down south. Is he back? He's been back for years. Yeah. Okay. But he was just he was he was never he was never indicted for murder, never charged. (laughs) uh, But he was a person of interest, and you know he he points out that like the Belize government wanted me to come in for questioning, and when you go in for questioning in Belize, that's usually when they hang you from your ankles and beat you half to death. So he's like, I didn't want to get questioned. One generally doesn't come back. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. I mean, this product seems a little ridiculous. I mean, it's basically one password, except it, uh, it's it's wireless and it'll connect to the Internet of Things, which is great. Oh, goody, goody gumdrops. <laughs> just what we need. Awesome. So if somebody steals your little uh, gadget now, they can just go right into your house. So we will be uh, back with a full blown security segment next week. But um, I just yeah. I wanted to round out the year with with a little McAfee. No, who doesn't? Comment of the week. Thank you to our new Patreon supporter, Jeff Bisbee. We Woo-hoo. appreciate it. Woohoo! Gonna buy me some champagne for the new year. Champagne. Yeah. Uh, and then we got a message via grumpyoldgeeks.com. This is from Miranda. Uh, you often talk about the fall of, quotes, the album, end quote. But have you heard of the band Baroness? They still elevate the concept of a musical album and have a strong visual style to back it up. The story of their latest album, Purple, gives some good insight into their process. And there is a YouTube link. Also, Happy New Year and thanks for the show. Well, thank you, Miranda, and uh, Happy New Year to you as well. Happy I have New Year for sure. Listen to Baroness. I'm guessing Jason probably has. I love Baroness. Uh, the Blue Album is always in heavy rotation when I'm working. It's a really good, heavy, nice, nice album that's just got meat to it. And and she's right. They really do. Their entire album is just kind of soundscapes that all mesh together. And like each song kind of rolls into the next song that rolls into the next song. And it really is like a full album production. There aren't really many what you would call like, you know, standalone no tracks. Yeah, there's no singles. <laughs> uh, what kind of music is it? It's kind of like it's. Not metal. It's kind of like industrial noise. Oh. Not, 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 not. I mean, maybe not industrial. It's, it's like guitar rock, but oh, kind okay. of meets industrial. It's kind of heavy. Right. Okay. I know a few bands in kind of the old 
industrial and electronica thing that sort of do the same thing. So I, I like that sort of stuff. So yeah, that's cool. I mean, I like artists that do that, but you know, are they making enough money to make a living doing their music? I don't, well, apparently they're still making albums, so that's yeah. good for them. But yeah. yeah, go check out the blue album on Spotify. <laughs> Uh, I shall. Okay. Yeah, and and just put it on in the background. And listen to the whole thing. It's really good. It's a, it's a really good album to work to. Excellent. Jake writes also from GrumpyOldGeeks.com. Geeks just finished all four available X Heroes books and really enjoyed them. The first three were great, but the fourth was a little rough. Since quote spoiler alert, <laughs> three quarters <laughs> of the book was spent reading about Saint George being a janitor. It wasn't bad, but it departed too radically from the way all three previous books were written. I also read the Milkweed Triptych and listened to Ready Player One and really enjoyed them all. Do keep up the book recommendations. Finally, any chance you guys could do a supplemental spoiler cast that discusses the new Star Wars movie? I'd like to hear your thoughts. Thanks again. <laughs> Respectfully, CPT, Jake Frechette. Thanks, Jake. Uh, actually, and I think Jason... that's Captain Jake Frechette. Yeah. Captain, I believe, yeah. Uh, Jason, we actually haven't talked about this. I don't know if the moratorium over doing spoilers for Star Wars is over yet. You know, it's a tough one to it's a tough one to call. We're going to have a little Star Wars chat uh, coming up soon, so we yeah, might we'll have tell to people the... to yeah to skip ahead when we get to that. I don't think we're going to do a full spoiler cast. I don't think I'd want to do that about Star Wars. We had talked about doing it for like Mr. Robot and things like that. I think maybe for uh, we could do spoiler cast for a book or a series. I, I don't know if Star Wars is really the one that we'd want to do that on. So and, and we're going to have yeah, that. It's, it's been done. Yeah. You know, everybody else is talking about it to, to death. So we're going to skip that one. We'll just give you a few impressions later on when we get to media candy. I think, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, as far as the X Heroes go, I totally agree with you. Uh, I love the first three. The fourth was a little bit rough I, because basically, I, I, St. George is super interesting uh, later on with what's going on, going back to his past. Well, not really his past from what I remember, but I won't get too, into too many spoilers. I, I did find that you know, book four dragged a little bit, but they saved it at the end. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed all four. Yeah. And um, I'm in the middle of the second uh, Milkweed mm -hmm. book right now and still loving that too. Oh, that stuff is so good. I'm glad it is really good. Yeah. I need All to right. go back and, and reread Ready Player One because I kind of forgot most of it. And because the, fo the follow up was so shitty. God, the follow up was so crap. Don't bother with Armada. Uh, yeah, but yeah, no, Armada Player One. So God, that was just uh, that 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 was one of those things like The Matrix where I didn't know anything about it going into it and was just blown away. Mm -hmm. So that was so good. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, Jake. And uh, anybody else, you can find us on Twitter at GOG Podcast or on Patreon at patreon.com slash GOG. Uh, we have a website at Gumpfield.com where you can listen to shows, leave feedback, or better yet, ask us questions that we can read on the air. If you have friends, and hopefully you do, please tell them about the show. And please, if you like the show, drop us an iTunes review. They really do help us out and only take a minute or two. Just go to grumpyoldgeeks.com slash iTunes and it'll take you right there. And I hope everybody out there has a happy new year and we look forward to uh, blabbing at you for all of 2016. Software, apps, and gadgets. Yeah, we, we were just joking off the air that uh, we do not have an at the library section this week because we're kind of on book hiatus, even though we just had a, a great, uh, great fan comment about our, our uh, at the library segment. But we're taking we're taking this time off to actually take some time off. So I haven't read a damn thing. Yeah, I've been, I haven't read it all. I would intended to spend a lot of time reading over the holiday, but it's just been uh, family and friends. And I basically have consumed nothing but uh, meat, sugar and alcohol for a week straight. So reading didn't really work into the equation. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Uh, but I do have uh, I had to replace a gadget. So I wanted to talk about my little gadget first here for a second. It's the Kershaw Ken Onion Black Leak Serrated Folding Knife with Speed Safe. <laughs> okay. I've had I've had this uh, I've had Kershaw Ken Onion knives, their pocket knives, for about ten years now, mm. and one of them finally died on me, and it was because I tried to oil it, and I used uh, some gun oil on it because I was I, that's the only oil I had, and yeah, it kind of broke it. So if you have one of these, don't use oil. Don't on use it. gun oil. Okay. No, just take it apart and clean it and put it back together. Yeah, the oil kind of destroyed it, so I had to get a new one, but I got a black one this time. It's very nice. I highly nice. recommend these. These are great little pocket knives. You, you don't really understand how much you use one until you have one. And then it's like, oh, I can just always use my pocket knife. They're, and they're, yeah, that's they're, true. I yeah. Actually, I, I agree with you there. I do have a pocket knife. I don't have one that could possibly kill people as well, but I have a pocket knife, and they're fantastic. Well, I mean, it, and any knife can kill somebody. This isn't made for that. This is just a, a nice, you know, portable utility knife that I use all the time. The speed safe stuff with the assisted open, mm -hmm. um, I would, if you, if you, 
want one of these knives, check with your local government, because <laughs> in some states, they are thoroughly illegal. In California, they are very legal. This is a very legal knife to carry on me at all times, because the uh, the state legislature passed the law that said assisted opening knives are good for first responders, firemen, uh, ambulance drivers, things like that, because they can use, they can open the knife easily one handed while they're, you know, working on somebody or doing something else. So that's one of the, one of the few things the California government got right. But okay. um, in some States they are thoroughly illegal because it basically is a switchblade. It's actually faster right. than a switchblade. <laughs> now I have another one that I haven't gotten and I don't think I'm going to get because it's really expensive, but I kind of like it. It's called the quirky writer. It is a mechanical keyboard for your uh, tablet device. Yeah, this has hipster written all over it. It really does. It's, <laughs> it looks like an old typewriter, but it's 349 bucks. so you lost me there. But it's, it's kind of cool looking. I got to give them that. It is cool. Does it make the noise? I don't know, but the return key is the little bar that you slide. Excellent. The, the return bar. It actually, That's pretty funny. Yeah, that works as your return key. It's pretty cool. I'd yeah, like to I mean, see one in person to see how, how like actually well made they are if they're just plastic then that would be ridiculous but this needs to have some metal in it if you really want to see one in person i guarantee you all you're gonna have to do is go down to a starbucks somewhere in like uh say los Feliz. no i gotta go to intelligentsia wherever the the hipsters hang out oh yeah the intelligentsia in los Feliz. i guarantee you we'll be full of these next week there's no hipster in in los Feliz at a starbucks sorry they go to intelligentsia for sure Media Candy. Back to one of our most popular segments, my Drunk on a Plane movie reviews. <laughs> well, most popular in your mind. In my mind. Uh, the only time I basically ever watch movies is in the flying theater in the sky when I'm traveling, and that usually involves <clears throat> a couple Jack and Cokes. Uh, so I've got two movies on my, uh, that I watched on my way out here to Toronto. I watched Vacation. Okay. The new, the, I take it that's the remake, not the, the old remake. one. The uh, remake. If you watch this, you should be shot. Okay. Avoid it. Everybody that made this fucking movie needs to go die in a horrible plane crash or fire. Uh, this is the steamiest pile of crap that I've ever seen in my entire life. It devalued. It, it was so bad. It makes me hate the original, which was genius. Oh, that's that's funny. I that's how bad it is. I could have told you that from the commercial, but man, uh, the, the only funny bits are in the commercial. Everything else is horrible. Uh, there weren't even that many funny bits in the commercial. There weren't even that many funny bits in the commercial. You can see everything coming from 20 miles away, and when it comes, it's, it just falls and duds and isn't funny. So, yeah, don't bother with that. Uh, and I watch Minions because I, I do enjoy those movies. And uh, Minions was fine. It wasn't as good as, as the, uh, the real ones are, but it was enjoyable, and uh, I, I chuckled a few times. Okay. That's what we got. All right. <laughs> So that's all I watch. Uh, I'll, I'll have more when I come back. Hopefully they'll have changed the movies because that's how bad my selection was. Uh, and we all know my love of Matt Damon. Yes, you do. Yeah. yeah. So the LAist has a funny little article about uh, all the amount of money that we've spent fictionally rescuing Matt Damon. <laughs> okay. Because we apparently spent a lot of time saving Matt Damon in various movies. So uh, over $900 billion we have spent <laughs> fictionally saving Matt Damon. And I'm just saying it's fucking Matt Damon. Let him die next time. He is, we have spent enough of my taxpayer money saving Matt Damon. Okay. Oh, yeah. I forgot, oh, I forgot about Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. That was a great movie, but yeah. Yeah. we got to stop saving him. Just let uh, him go. Let him go. $900 billion, people. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Dude, just step away from the microphone. <laughs> Sorry. I, you know, I'm not in my normal surroundings. Here. I can tell that uh, you're, you're getting very excited. Yes, I'm about getting, Matt you know, it's Matt Damon. Yeah. Uh, and then I have a link in to uh, Huffington Post, which I thought was actually pretty good. It's it's 40 unforgivable plot holes in Star Wars The Force Awakens. This was sent to me by a friend of the show, Mike, uh, though I did pick apart some of them already. And I was like, at least five of these, they did actually explain if you were paying attention. Well, it's the Huffington Post. They don't actually do real research. Exactly. Uh, and, and here's the point. It could have had 400 plot holes. I didn't care. I walked out of that movie smiling my ass off. I loved it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I thought it was very good. It is easily the first movie within 20 years that I want to see again in a theater that I'm not you know, going to wait to see again at home. I will see this again in the theater. And that's pretty high praise from me. Yeah, definitely. I'm going back. I saw it in IMAX 3D. I'm going to go back and see it again in IMAX 3D with a better seat <laughs> than a crappy seat. <laughs> but yeah, all in all, it was I thought just it was great. Everything it, about it, it was great. It brought the magic back. It 
felt like Star Wars. Um, after seeing it, I went home and I threw on a DVD of, uh, you know, the horrible prequel, uh, the first one, and I couldn't sit through it. It was just horrible. And all I wanted to do was go back and, and see uh, JJ's version. Um, it feels like Star Wars. It looks like Star Wars. It was surprisingly funny. Um, and I don't think we'll get into too many other spoilers. It's just really, really good. Yeah, that's it. I, I mean, I give it uh, five lightsabers up. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I know that was so bad. <laughs> yeah. And it was supposed to be. Yeah, no, go see it. Seriously, just go see it. My dad, even who has n- not gone to the theater in, you know, probably 10 years and is so jaded because I, he, I took him to go see the first prequel when it came out. And he, he walked out the door after the first uh, seeing, you know, the Jar Jar Binks one. And he's just like, what the fuck was that? Yeah. <laughs> he was so yeah. mad. He was so I- mad. That's how I felt rewatching it too, right after seeing uh, the new one. So that was good. Uh, and of course, immediately after this came out, um, the the story has been doing the rounds that a new Spaceballs movie is in the works, according to Mel Brooks. Uh, this is a link via the Nerdist. I personally am not buying it. I don't think this is going to get made. And uh, yeah, I don't think it's happening. I don't think it's going to get made. I don't want it to get made, and I don't care even if it did get made because I didn't really care for the first one. I thought it was reasonably funny, but I mean, this was the tail end of Mel Brooks making really good movies. You know, Robin Hood, Men in Tights, and Spaceballs were probably the last that were kind of funny. And, you know, I I love Mel Brooks, don't get me wrong, but I think that things have moved on a bit, and he doesn't have his pulse on the humor of uh, this culture anymore as he used to. No offense, Mel. I mean, I'll watch Blazing Saddles once a year, every year, until I die. (laughs) Yeah. And Young Fonstein, and all your classics, so... Yeah, no, he's, his, his prime is past, but uh, yeah. yeah, his classics are still classics. I agree. I've been watching Making a Murderer on Netflix. So has everyone else in the effing world, apparently, because I'd I never know. heard that thing, and I'm off of media, and basically just, I, I look at Facebook every now and then, and everything is Making a Murderer. What is this? Uh, so it's a story about a guy who went to jail for 18 years for a rape he didn't commit, and then is ba- basically, I'm seven episodes in, I got three to go. And it looks like he's being framed for a murder. Is this is this a documentary? Is this fiction? It's what? documentary. It's okay. real. It's all real. Everything oh, about it's real. Um, and so I'm not going to do any spoilers on it because I don't have any because I haven't finished it yet. I find it terribly boring for the most part. Some parts are interesting, but all of this like rave and review about it, it's like this is the Netflix, the serial version for Netflix. And I'm just like, yeah, no, no. <laughs> And basically taking the thunder of Serial, because nobody seems too into the new version of Serial. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is all I'm hearing about. People are raving about it, and people are saying things about how they don't ever want to move back to the States because of this. Uh, I've, I haven't seen anything. I have no comment. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know next week if it's if it's worth you know, <laughs> diving into. But if you're into police corruption, I think this is definitely worth watching. And who isn't? Yeah, that's the whole thing. Um, so since I get really bored with that, and I actually went and started watching Jessica Jones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, we, there were so many bad reviews about it that I'm like, okay, well then I, I can skip it. But then I started watching it. I'm two episodes in, and I I really like it. I think it's really good. Really? Yeah. You heard nothing but bad reviews because all I heard was that it was great. Yeah, okay. I haven't. Yeah, I I, I must have missed all the good reviews because everybody okay. that I know said it was it was it was lame, and I love it so far. That's great. I I definitely that is on my list of things to watch. I, I've heard a lot about it. I want to get to it. Um, I don't believe it's actually available on Netflix here in Canada unless I, you know, go sneaky. Uh, but I'll wait until I get home anyways. I got too much to do here. Yeah, the one thing that I didn't know about it uh, before when I was like, oh, I'm not going to watch it, is that David Tennant is the villain. And I'm like, okay, well, if if David Tennant's in it, I'm going to watch it. You know, I have a David Tennant rule. If he's in something, I watch it because I yeah. love David Tennant. Yeah. And uh, he's not. he hasn't even really shown up yet. And he's already one of the creepiest villains I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, he's barely in it, and he is oh man, vicious. So I think it's gonna. I I think it's gonna be good. I'm. I can't wait to get get into it a little more. Yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm definitely gonna watch that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, the last thing we have for media candy is I found a link on Fast Company. Uh, this is about the science behind what music does to our brains. This is actually I was studying this in. in college because I kind of did a dual major in music and psychology. So this is right up my wheelhouse. I, I put this in here because we've talked a lot about trying to basically get off podcasts as much as we are and kind of 
listen to music more. We talked about those wonderful headphones, which allow us to do so. Uh, but this article is more specifically kind of about using music to augment creativity and throughout your workday as opposed to just listening to it. So I thought it was really interesting. Uh, if you're into this and you kind of want to figure out a way to sort out uh, a good creativity burst slash way to make it through your workday a little bit better without distracting yourself. Uh, there's a lot of tips and tricks in here and a lot of science. So I'd highly recommend giving it a read. Awesome. I will definitely check that out because I like, like that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> uh, we do have, actually, there's one final one that I just I oh. put in here. Um, you know, the mayhem guy from those all state commercials. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are pretty funny commercials actually. Yeah. They're funny commercials. And what they're doing now is he's going to recreate some, some of the best, uh, YouTube fails out there. So they're doing a, they're kind of doing a, uh, a contest. There are four people that they've picked and whoever wins the voting, he will, he will recreate it in a very funny way. So now that is social marketing people. Well, you know what I, you know what I think this is? It, it comes back. It might even be the same team who knows. Cause it's a small world. Uh, the, Oh, what's his name? The old spice guy. Remember when they did the old oh, yeah, spice a thon yeah. and like people would write, write in tweets and he would like recreate or like answer their tweets or recreate the tweets. Exactly. Yeah, that was, yeah. that was pretty good. So this kind of, this kind of harkens back to those days, but yep. I'm looking forward to this one. I think it'll be fun. Oh, this should be fun. I, I have, yeah, I've really enjoyed these commercials. They actually did a really good job. So well done people. Yeah. And if you like the mayhem guy, I would recommend going back and watching HBO series Oz where he, uh, that's the first time I saw him and he's fantastic in that. Excellent. Closing shout out. Yeah, well, like we said, it's going to be a short show. Uh, we've both really been kind of enjoying our vacation, but we figured we'd want to say hi and, and give you guys something. Uh, I've got some meat and sugar and alcohol to get to, so uh, we're going to clear out of here pretty soon. I just wanted to quickly just uh, ask you, Jason, if you had any predictions for the coming year. I have two. Okay. Um, not so much. I haven't even been thinking about it that much because, you know, they get shoved down our throat so much. I, I try and stay away from predictions because I'm, I'm generally wrong. You know, That's, well, I'm hoping I'm going to be wrong as well. Let me just uh, toss the two out because I did spend a little time thinking about it, doing prep for this show, actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think there are two things that will dominate the headlines all year for us in tech. I think the, the two big things are going to be, this is the year that VR Oculus Rift, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is going to be shoved down our throats whether we want it or not, um, judging from most of the stats I've seen, not not this is not an, a formal poll by any means, but most of the people I talked to that went to see Star Wars, they want 2D, not 3D, so I don't think we want VR. I think VR is going to be huge for gaming, but there this is the year where it's going to be like, VR is going to change everything, and it's going to become part of your life, and you're going to have an Oculus Rift, and you're going to wear it all the time. So be prepared for that bullshit. Okay, yeah, I'm not looking forward to it. I want to try one. I really want to try one. I would like to yeah. try one in in conjunction with a drone with stereoscopic vision so I can fly the drone from my VR. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there are limited use cases for VR that make sense, and that's totally one of them. Uh, gaming is going to be huge as well, but I don't think that we need to bleed this into everything else in the world, which is what they want to do. And my second bet for this year is this. I mean, we've been dancing around this for a while, but I think governments are going to start to get involved. This is the year of the great unbundling debate. Okay. We are going to see what happens with cable providers and people that are trying to get off, you know, cut the wires and things like that and, and really start to basically do unbundling, um, especially since we've got the Netflix and the Hulus and the apps and the Apple TVs and all that coming along. It's going to be a big deal this year. Uh, there are more than a few lawsuits pending, I believe. So we're going to hear a lot about that. Yes. The year of a la carte. Yep, pretty much. So we shall see. Those are my guesses. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, some of the Canadian friends of the show that I ran into this week, uh, particularly Ted and Kevin had a fantastic time. And uh, basically a shout out to Jason for yet another year of us doing this. Woohoo. Yep. I'm going to show a, uh, show a throw <laughs> out. <laughs> wow. I'm going to throw a shout out to my puppy, Bam Bam. And I, uh, to, I look forward to meeting Bam Bam. Yeah. So I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to talk about her on the show because uh, that's, this is not a puppy podcast. Um, but check hey, out it's a her. Hmm? It's a her. Yes. She and went with bam, bam, not pebbles. I did because if, when you see the size of her paws and when she walks, it's just like, bam, bam, bam. It okay. <laughs> very much has the temperament of bam, bam. And I know bam, bam is generally a boy's name, but I went with it because right. it's a dog. So it doesn't really matter. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to start up my, my new blog at life with bam, bam.com where all the okay. pictures will go. So I can try and, not have so many unfollows on social media. I'm just going to keep it in one place. You can and follow keep, her there. Keep an eye out for Puppy Pod. 
Yeah, coming soon. Yes. Um, and the last shout out, or uh, not the last shout out. Um, we did in my day job, the Art of Charm. We did a best of 2015 episode where all the guys from behind the scenes came out and talked about their favorite episodes. It was really fun. It was it was a blast to do. And if you're unfamiliar with what I do day to day, go check out the this episode and you can kind of get a taste of it. And uh, that's about that. And right. I would also like to thank my co-host, Brian, for putting up with me for yet another year. Oh, uh, it's, you know, it's always a good time. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Well, you have a good New Year tonight with uh, playing with your puppy and falling asleep at 11. Oh, let me let me shout out to the parents out there that might be listening to this right away. And Jason as well, since he's probably going to go to bed early. Netflix is doing a thing where they are basically doing fake countdowns that you can bring up at any time to trick your children so they will go to bed. Oh, that's genius. It is genius. So uh, keep a lookout for that if you are a parent. <laughs> oh, man, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Jason DeFilippo, and uh, you can check me out at jpd.me and soon Life with Bam Bam. Oh, yes, of course. And I'm Brian Schulmeister, and you can follow me on Twitter at Slender Fungus, where I occasionally update, but not really. <laughs> until next time. Until next year. Until next year, everyone. Well, actually, no. This is airing next year, so until next time. Okay. Grumpy Old Geese is a fan supported show. Check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash POG. We really appreciate your support. If you don't want to or can't donate but still want to support the show, please go to grumpyoldgeeks.com slash iTunes and leave us a few words and five stars to tell a friend about the show. Intro music for the show is provided by the band Among Us. And then on iTunes, Spotify, and Apple Music. Or you can donate through the Grumpy Old Geeks Patreon page at patreon.com slash POG to get 10 exclusive tracks. Outro music for the show is provided by Andy Spachansky. Follow Andy at twitter.com slash House of Andy, and he's also on SoundCloud at grumpyoldgeeks.com slash Andy. Show notes for all the links discussed in this episode can be found at grumpyoldgeeks.com slash 141. Happy New Year!